you, Dr. Jumeir, for having me here, for inviting me. I have experienced a lot already in Georgia Carter here. We met a lot of students and staff and doctors and pharmacists, nurses. So it's, it's a big honor to be here and share some ideas with you. So I hope with the next like 40 minutes we can also I can share some of my research and we can have discussions around that. So I just want to start easy, yeah. after lunch, easy with some pictures, uh, pictures from Groningen. Anyone who's been to Groningen? How from the No? Anyone been to the Netherlands? No? Okay, yeah, let's we'll see. We may see in the future, maybe. Let me show you Groningen is an old town, very old town. We have very nice historic buildings. And this, this is the main academy building of the university where we celebrate our PhD ceremonies. And this is the old church over there with a very high tower with a beautiful view of, of the landscape from this uh, Martini Tower. This is a picture of all of the PhD ceremonies um, with all the professors in gowns. So. Okay, this is just a few uh, facts about the university. Again, it's old, it's one of the oldest ones in the Netherlands, 400, more than 400 years old. And we have um, many, you can study many different topics. We have a lot of students, we have also a lot of international students. We have now degrees in English as well. A lot of most of the master degrees in my faculty are in English and uh, bachelor degrees as well. We also have some very famous researchers, like Ben Fieringa, who he got his in the Department of Chemistry in my faculty. He got the Nobel Prize two years ago. Um, so this is a bit about um, the university, and this is where... <laughs> This is where, where I work. This is the big hospital. Um, and, and they, oh yeah, oh, comes. This is where my department is. Uh, this is where, uh, uh, I'm just, uh, this is a very nice building and I'm just behind this nice building. Um, uh, but this is from me and it's a nice thing like the years that I'm a part of the pharmacy. I um, belong to Faculty of Science and Engineering. But we also, we are located with the University Hospital and the medical faculty. So all our research is with humans. So that's very nice that we are there, very close, and we collaborate a lot with all of those, uh, all of those people. And this is, we have a, like I said, we did, I teach in the, in the faculty of the Department of Pharmacy, so we have a Bachelor in Pharmacy, we have a Master in Pharmacy, we have also a Master in Medical Pharmaceutical Sciences, which a lot of Foreign students also take, but half of the students are come, come from abroad, also from Indonesia. So depending what you want to come with and what you like to go, maybe this is also something interesting for you. Okay, now I really want to start with the talk and the content, and I'll start with the patient case. Because much of the research I have been said is about drug utilization, it's about medications. I want to start and think a little bit about this case as one of the examples of, yeah, to think about what's good about drug therapy and what's not, what may be not good. Uh, so this is, um, let me introduce you to Mrs. Hansel. She's, um, she's a 90-year-old widow. And this is with aging in other societies, uh, Western societies. She's a typical patient. And uh, maybe you don't need that much patients like this is Hansel nowadays in your hospitals. But I'm sure with aging, with uh, increase of life expectancy, uh, you may need uh, people like this is Hansel here as well, uh, soon before. So she lives in a nursing home. Where she lives in a nursing home because she can't cope with all the everyday things anymore. So she needs some help. So this is not a real picture, but this is what she could look like. So she needs help with daily activities. And this is her medical history. Quite a long list, and this is typical. Patients like Mrs. Hansen who are old, they have also a lot of different diseases. And guess how many drugs she's getting for those diseases? You think five? More than five, yeah, more than five. 
that's one. This is the list of medication she is taking. So it's quite a lot. And we won't go much into all the details now, but I think what is important that when we look at her this very closely, you see some of the problems she has, like uh, pain. Her biggest problem is now pain. She's got five medications for pain. That's not probably not rational. Because you can't really see anymore whether which drug is working, which drug is not working. So this is um, um, but over the years such a list has accumulated. And there are some drugs she's taking, no one really knows why they're used anymore. So this is patients like this polypharmacy. Multimorbidity of polypharmacy is a big problem in this our country. And I think what we discussed this week, this is also for different patient groups, also a big problem here. If you treat several morbidities, and you know, how do you also balance which? Uh, because with drug lists like this, you don't know the, what are the side effects and what are the effects of those drugs. And we looked very well in the list, and we cut off half of the drugs. And we optimized the dosing of the pain treatment to get, and, and she got better. She didn't, of course, she didn't. She's very old, she has a lot of diseases. She can't be like very fit again. But with taking half the drugs, she's still the same, and her pain is treated now well, and that's her main problem. And we added some drugs to help her. So that's, that's a bit the context, like, um, as an example, we'll get back to this concern and how we deal with that in healthcare a few times during that journey. Okay, so what do I want to talk about? I just want to talk first about complex healthcare interventions and a bit the context, start with the context, and then give you some examples from my uh, research and then end with some other useful resources. So we go first start a little bit thinking about complex interventions and what they are. Yeah. Um, because then, when we think about drug development, developing drugs, I'm sure you're familiar with the development of drugs and we have on this side, we have the basic science who develop drugs in laboratories and we do a lot of testing, toxicology testing, in vitro testing. We do a lot of development. And then at some stage, we get into clinical research and we try and do clinical trials on drugs to find the state of the effectiveness and safety. And then somehow, drugs get licensed somewhere here. Drugs are found to be effective and also the Indonesian authorities license drugs. And so they get into, uh, into usage. Clinical practice here. But I think in research, there is a big gap here in between. Because what we know from practice is that drugs are effective, but how are they used in practice? Sometimes, like Mrs. Hansen, this is not really used. She's got a list, long list of medications, 14, 15, 16 medications, and it's not, it's not good use of medication. Whereas, individually, all of those drugs have to be approved, they've gone all through those steps, but somehow they get into practice, and here it gets sometimes very messy. And we have a lot of evidence that drug use leads to hospitalizations of people. We have medication errors, we have a lot of problems in all healthcare systems with drug use and optimizing drug use. So I think there is, and up to maybe 20 years ago, there was not that much research here in between. So what I want to show you is we need, this has been developed very well, translational research from bench to bedside and the clinical trials, everything we do. But I think we need to now work much better on these steps. Translational research to get our knowledge from bedside clinical research into practice and translation into clinical practice. And I think some of this, and Dr. Gurley has been um, involved in many, I think some of the tools we use, is like meta analysis, like there has been a Cochrane Center now established here as well in Indonesia, who gather all the evidence. So that, that's very helpful, these guidelines. Implementation research. But I think most of the things I'll talk about is this practice-based research where we try and develop an 
to evaluate interventions that help us to improve education use in my case, but it can be used for other to improve surgery, it can be to improve nutrition, other interventions to think of as well. And I'll start with I'll start with one success story. I'll show you some success stories later on. But I'll show you one just to get us thinking about one intervention that we developed, which in the end, like you can see here, was not successful. And this is the case. We did a uh, we did a randomized controlled trial of this intervention, which is the gold standard, a randomized controlled trial. So you just one group gets the intervention, one group doesn't get the intervention. And the intervention was that we selected groups, we selected patients who took a lot of medication which, with a lot of side effects. And we used the drug burden index, the drug burden index as a tool to identify. It's a way of adding up drugs for patients who have a lot of side effects. And we added up those drugs and identified patients with at least a drug burden index of two, which is very negative. And the intervention group, we reviewed the doctor and pharmacist together, reviewed the medication very well, and they tried, like with Mrs. Hansen, they tried to cut off all the drugs and reduce this drug burden for the patient. And we thought this was a clever way um, you know, to identify high risk patients and to give them some intervention, and we compare that to the control group, which just got care as usual, so everything was done like normal. They didn't get this multi, we call it a multidisciplinary, multi step medication review. But, um, this is the slide of the results. We were very, everyone was very disappointed because our intervention didn't work. We had in the control group, we had maybe 16% of patients we could manage. It was, uh, the drug burden index was reduced after three months. We measured the drug burden index at baseline, and we measured after three months. And maybe 16% of the patients, it was reduced in the control group, and maybe 15% in the intervention group. And in the end, you see here statistically no difference. No difference between intervention and control. And of course, our pharmacists and doctors were also disappointed because they thought they did their best. But what it, said, what it means is that it was not possible to re reduce this drug burden index. Even though we developed a nice intervention, we thought, and it's that kind of thing. Medication reviews are used for other patient groups. It was new to use it for drug burden index patients, but it was used in other groups of patients as well. But here, in this case, it didn't work. I want to ask first question for you. What do you think, what could be reasons why our intervention wasn't successful? What could be reasons? Just brainstorm a little Maybe you brainstorm one minute with your neighbor. Just uh, discuss a little bit what, why did this not work? What are reasons why a randomized control trial like this could not work? And then I'll ask uh, when you come up with some ideas. Let's see, but just over here, we have a good discussion. Any idea? <laughs> no, I just, just say something. <laughs> or you discuss something else. <laughs> Anyone else has got an idea? Why? Why could it be done? Because they still should take the regular medication as well, even with the kind of the therapies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though it's, yeah, yeah. so they need, they, yeah, that could be a reason that we selected a group with many problems, but they still need the medication. Yeah, that could be another thing that is all this, maybe they did not or really need it from a pharmacological, but it was not possible to stop. I think that's a very important reason. That even though, you know, we saw from the data this is vulnerable patient with a lot of problems, but it was just not possible to stop them, to stop the drugs. Yeah. Any other idea? Yeah. I think these are a bit, little bit the thoughts that we have.
and when we looked at those uh, results of the trial, and we've published the trial, it was quite difficult to publish because there was sort of negative results, but the publishing is easy. Um, um, and I think what we saw is that the drug burden index is a good tool to identify these patients, but it was much too complex for our doctors and pharmacists to be able to stop those drugs, because these were long-term drugs like sleeping tablets, antidepressants, antipsychotics. Patients took them for a long time, and it's not easy to stop those drugs. Even though they are more appropriate, it wasn't just, just the want of meeting between the pharmacist and the doctor was not enough to change, to really improve that. So, um, I'll show you later on what we, what we did instead, because we knew this patient group has to be helped, but this was not the way. And, um, but I think it also means, uh, it doesn't mean that the medication reviews should be abandoned completely. It just means that in this patient group, they probably, the way we did it, doesn't work. Um, and I think so, that's what I mean. With, we need, I think, target and tailored approaches to really get to this. And then in hindsight, you could think, well, and that's what I want to go with the next step of the presentation, you could think could we have prevented this? Maybe because the randomized controlled trial is a lot of work. It's a lot of work because it's very formal procedure to include the patients, to randomize, to ensure you're double blind. The uh, researchers collecting the data don't know what the question is and they don't know if it's international control patient. It's also very expensive. It takes a lot of time. Do you think, well, could we have done it differently? And I think that's what I want to talk to you. I think now we know a lot more recent years how to develop complex healthcare interventions. Because it, um, I'll show you in a minute what a complex healthcare intervention is. And I think we can learn more, hopefully. Um, you can learn a bit more for if you develop such interventions for patient groups. Um, yeah? And uh, maybe if there. Yeah. We'll go into biology now. This is, uh, I hope you saw, I hope you saw us our arms, little arms crawling around. And the next picture is a bird, a picture of birds. Why do I show these? These are complex systems in biology. And in biology we know these complex systems, they, um, they are made of little individual, um, like the birds and the arms. And together they form something. Together they are a complex system, and this is much more synergy. This is much more than the individual arm. Together they achieve a lot more. But it also depends on the individual and their interactions together. To, for example, um, for the arms to have um, food, find food to breathe, or for the birds to um, to migrate. I think, and what we can learn from this for healthcare is how complex system works. Because if you change them, they change, and you can also model them uh, in biology with systems. So a lot from systems biology has been also transferred to how we could look at complex healthcare intervention. And um, let's uh, look at the next one. Like with this spot, yeah, this spot. Um, going back, how does this work? For complex healthcare interventions, what we can learn from biology. Like we know from arms, a complex system are from single components, and uh, like the arms or the birds. And with our complex healthcare intervention, which I talked about, the multidisciplinary medication review, they are also made of single components. And these single components in this case is patients. A lot of patients agree not some doctors, red dot, and some pharmacists, few pharmacists, all doctors and a lot more patients. So these are the single components, and they have interactions with each other, like the pharmacist with the patient, and the doctor with the patient, and the doctor with the pharmacist. All of them have interactions. And so that forms already a quite a small complex, but it's three components, you know, so you think it's not that complicated. But if we go on and on, we have a lot more actors, a lot more components in our system. So we have 
the doctor or some other specialist, like the cardiologist or the geriatrician. This is general practitioner, but they have with a lot of specialists in hospitals, they have contact. The patients may be treated by many different specialists. And if we go on clicking, we have also the patient as neighbors, friends, uh, family, who are also part of the system. They also give advice to the patient. So as you can see, it's quite a complex, this is a complex system. Hopefully you can see from this picture that a lot of interventions can be very complex. They have, they have multiple components and they all interact with each other. Like little arms interacting in an arm or the birds interacting. And so this is, um, I think we, we need to consider healthcare, com inter healthcare interventions as complex. And this has consequences if we do research with them, if we want to evaluate those complex healthcare interventions. Yeah, so these are just a list of features. It's multiple potential and interacting components. A lot of it depends on social interactions. And I think this is also important in the field of complex healthcare interventions. They are embedded in a system. So this means also if we do trials in the US with, a, with an intervention, we have to look very careful at their healthcare context because it may not be transferable to any other healthcare system. So that's also um, a feature of complex healthcare interventions. And they are dynamic, they evolve, people get trained, they change, maybe uh, the healthcare changes, the reimbursement changes. This may have all effects on our intervention. Yeah, that's what? And I think if you want to get into the area of complex healthcare interventions, developing, evaluating complex healthcare interventions, I think this is a very, very nice source, um, uh, source in the, developed in the UK, and they've, uh, this is the first edition, they've updated this in 2008, and this is a very nice framework which helps you think about uh, this area. Next, and this is the key the key figure from this framework, and this is how key elements of the development and evaluation. And we start here with the development, and I'll talk a little bit more about development in a minute. You know, you think about development, you think of a new idea, how to organize your care differently, how to help a patient group, like the medication reviews, you think of a new way of an intervention, and then instead of going directly try out your idea in a randomized controlled trial. You go through several steps of development, you test the feasibility, and only if you've done a lot of research in this area, you're sure that you've done a lot. Well, and I'll show you some more examples how to do that. You go to into evaluation in a randomized controlled trial like we've done. And then you can, if this is successful and you've learned a lot how to do it, you can go into implementation. So you can learn about how to really upscale that and like implement it in many hospitals around the uh, country or in many different primary care practices, you do ways of working. And I think this has, if you go through this cycle, you have a lot more chances to end up with a, with a good intervention which will really achieve your goal. So remember our unsuccessful intervention, we, even though we did some steps, I think we didn't do enough steps of this before we went to the evaluation. So we, we were, I think in some ways we wasted it, but we learned a lot. We may have wasted some resources because we had to go back instead of going to into implementation. Okay, next. And these are two, I won't talk that much about, but these are two sort of frameworks. These are very recent from this year frameworks which go a lot more into the development. So what are the elements if you think of, if you have a new idea, we have this health problem, and how do we want to solve this health problem? How can we do that? And these are like um, uh, steps put together, and maybe we'll, this is one way of doing it. And the next one, this is a very, very nice uh, paper, again, published, not, this is two years ago, um, from different malaria interventions, and they thought, well, you need, really need to, to define the scope, define very well what is your problem that you want to solve, and then you need to have research in several steps to design the intervention, and a lot of 
a pilot study, so look at the evidence, look at uh, literature, systematic literature reviews, what is the evidence that something what you thought of may work? What are the individual components of your intervention? What are the multiple components? And you find those, and think about those. Uh, looking also at theory, a lot of this is in psychology, behavioral theories. You can learn a lot from um, from from those other disciplines. It's, it's really also a multidisciplinary activity, this, and to be able to do that. Um, look at the next. And I think some of what I've shown you now gets a bit more if I give you some examples of just the theory. So you can read in those papers um, yourself later on. Um, so going back to our problem, our problem with the high load of uh, drugs with anticholinergic and sedative medication, going back to that problem we knew from our trial, this, these patients need help. There is unsafe drug use in this group. And um, then we thought, well, if they use it for a very long time, it's difficult to change it. So we need to be much earlier when the drugs are newly started. We need to then think about really is is there does it, uh, to prevent any chronic long term use, and really think is there a need to start a new drug for the patient. And what we did is we worked with community pharmacists, and this is a typical picture of a community pharmacy in the Netherlands, and they have an electronic record uh, of all the patients of all the medication history. Uh, it's quite, um, they, can, they can do a lot with that, as the monitoring for drug drug interactions. And we use those records and said we want to find patients with a high load of the drug burden index who have already a high load, take several of those drugs. And if they get a new drug from this group, we want to have an alert. We want to have an alert and say to the pharmacist, look, this patient has already many drugs and he gets another one. He or she gets another one. And so we look at this patient and discuss with the GP and the patient is this new drug really needed because it adds to the burden and can you change this new drug to something safer or maybe just limit the use like the sleeping tablets really monitor that it's limited use and we use it for two, three weeks and then stop again or can you change something of the old medication because if the new drug is really needed maybe you can change something of the old medication to lower the burden and we did this, um, um, and we found that uh, we did this trial pilot study in 50 community pharmacies, we included over 300 patients, and we found in comparison to our earlier trial, this looked much more promising. It was possible to change this in 30% of the patients. And I'm going, going back to our development model, this was not a randomized controlled trial, this was just a pilot study as a first step of seeing whether our new thinking, our new model of identifying patients, of working with the patients, whether that is potentially successful. And we did a lot of questionnaires with the pharmacists, and we asked the pharmacists and the patients, do you like this? Do you like to work like this? What's the problem with working there? We got a lot of information not to change because it was quite time consuming what they did. So we know in the next step of development of this intervention, we need to make it more efficient. It takes much too long to identify the patient and it's it's not efficient yet. So but we learn stepwise. This is an example, we are not there yet. We, the PhD student um, who's done this work. She will graduate in two weeks' time, and I will discuss again how what's next step of this development, um, how we go on further to develop this further. So this example on how to do stepwise instead of rushing and, and learning. And the next one is another PhD student where we work in, in for diabetes patients. And we try and develop an intervention. Uh, for diabetes patients, because pharmacists in the Netherlands they don't do that much for diabetes patients, even though we have quite a big group, uh, and I think in Indonesia diabetes is also definitely a bigger problem. So, the aim of her PhD was to develop a, a pharmacist led intervention for frail diabetes patients. And we started, like remember, we want to develop, we want to develop an intervention, but we started very systematically now, stepwise, and we did first a literature review. And this is part of since they published this spring, um, a literature review. Uh, we gathered all the evidence available, 
for the pharmacist led interventions for diabetes patients to improve self management. And then we found, we did a meta analysis, and we found yes, pharmacists <coughs> are and improve self-management, and we did some subgroup analysis, but we couldn't really find the ideal intervention, because what it says in this review, all interventions seemed to work. It didn't really matter much what they did, but if they did something, it worked. So unfortunately, we, we got some information, we think, well, it's a successful approach that pharmacists do something, but we don't, from this review, we don't really know what's the ideal, what's the best way. So it needs more. So we did some more steps in this development process. So currently, um, Linda is analyzing, she did qualitative interviews with pharmacists, with GPs and patients. What do you need to investigate more? What is, what is the problem? What is really the problem for those patients? And what could pharmacists contribute? And what we learned is that, for example, the patients don't see don't see pharmacists as a very important healthcare professional. So we also know, you know, any service that the pharmacists want to provide, they have to really make their best to, you know, to be they are accessible for patients, but patients don't see them as something helpful for their self-management. So there is still a lot of work to do. And we think, I think one of the reasons for this is that our pharmacists lack some communication skills with patients. Because they say, well, they have, they know what they could do, but they never sort of experience patients with problems. Patients with problems don't come to them. So I think the next step we did now um, is uh, we videoed a lot of conversations between pharmacists and patients and we'll analyze what are their communication skills and what could be learned from that to improve those communication skills. Because I think one of the solutions may be communication training for pharmacists because otherwise they can't find the patients, can't help the patients with the problems. Um, and we'll do some epidemiology also, how many patients are there with the problems. So these are little puzzle pieces of the puzzle to get together an intervention. I think this is a way to get to more effective interventions, which can have a lot more impact than if you don't do all of those steps. And I thought I'll share also one success story where we did have a successful intervention. These were also medication reviews, like I've shown you before, where the pharmacist and the doctor together look at all the medication, like this is Hansen's medication. And we did, again, we did a randomized control trial, and in this case we did find an effect. So we know from this that medication reviews can be very successful for these, and really the, the patients in this trial for patients like Mrs. Hansen, like I've shown you, with a lot of poor pharmacy, the pharmacist and the doctor could stop a lot of drugs and a lot more in the intervention room than in the control room uh, with usual care. But there was some, I think there is some additional benefit of doing that. And this was also statistically significant. Um, and I want to have, I have another question for you. When we now did this trial, uh, in our nursing homes, uh, where we saw some success. Is this now that we need, the next step is to say, well, this we found successes here, so everyone in the whole world has to do it like we've done it. Is it generalized for two everywhere? So that's the next question. Maybe you can also discuss with your neighbor for a minute. How can we sort of know our results of it? randomized controls trials, there are hundreds of randomized control trials of interventions are published. But to what extent can we know that they are critical elsewhere, generalized with data? Just a minute to discuss this. Okay, some ideas. Some ideas. How can we know whether these are generalizable? What can we? Is it generalizable? Is it? Can I now recommend? We've shown medication reviews are good for nursing home patients. Do them in the whole of Indonesia as well. 
Is this a good idea? No, no, not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? Someone wants to say something? Mr. Chair? You said it's not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? I'm sorry, my English is oh, not so good. Oh, that's our question. Yeah, you can speak it straight, but I can translate it. Yeah. I, I will, I will uh, try to yeah, talk okay. in English. Yeah. Uh, uh, I am a doctor and I usually meet patients in, uh, in my practical activity. Yeah. Apa itu? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, the behavior of the patient, uh, they will ask us to give them uh, a drug which is uh, specific to their their yeah. they eat yeah. their, their illness yeah. Yeah. so if uh, we meet Mrs. Mrs. Hansen like that we will give like polypharmacists like that because uh, they know that it is for, for uh, low back pain, it yeah. is for her uh, yeah. heart rate and yeah. for etc. Yeah. And they know that if I have headache, I will train this and, and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, 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 maybe it's like that and uh, all of the patient in Indonesia is like that. I will ask the drug of headache, I will ask the drug for uh, stomach ache and so on. Yes. And we know that there is polypharmacies, but we we cannot, uh, if we don't communicate with them, we cannot give the simpler of the pharmacies. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what you say is really our model doesn't fit with Indonesian healthcare, the culture, how it works. So it would never work here. You could never. So I think that's one of the, like what we said, an intervention depends a lot on the healthcare context. So it wouldn't work. So it's not a good idea uh, uh, to just, just transfer it. And what, within research, also there, um, within such brief talk in this, uh, because I think they're not generalizable for everywhere, but of course, there is probably also no need to do it in every nursing home, the same trial. That would be also, I think, it could be done, it could be probably medical resources, it's also not useful. So I think there's something in between, and what we did with our, because we also got some questions, when we published a trial, it was an editorial alongside, and there was a letter, and they asked them the questions, what is, you know, you describe your trial, but what are ingredients in your trial, what did the pharmacist exactly do, what did the patient do, and how did you involve us? because all of those details, we couldn't describe everything in the trial, but people need to know that information, because then they can think about, well, our healthcare system is different in this way, so this way we could maybe adapt this model a little bit to our healthcare system. And this is, so all those, info, those questions, I just put two, those questions we didn't really answer in the paper, but we did the original first paper, but we did qualitative, qualitative. And this is one way, this is just one way of doing, maybe getting some more of that information that's important for generalizability. Uh, and we did qualitative interviews with everyone involved, with residents, with pharmacists, physicians, nursing staff, family, everyone involved. And um, here I can't show you everything, but uh, just a few ideas that, that, are, that we got from these interviews. It's important that the pharmacist and the doctor have a good relationship. So in a healthcare system where the pharmacist and the doctor are not used to working together, no point in just uh, already starting this. So this was, that was, uh, but even in our system they are working. So it needs to be embedded in other cooperation. We have that. But we also saw that the pharmacist and the physician had also some problems in sharing information. You know, there were the, we had interviews, we had doctors saying, well, you know, the pharmacist shouldn't start sitting on my chair, this is my chair, the prescribing. So it's also some sort of collaboration that has to involve 
and you have to you have to know that to, to be able to, to work with that. And also about the involving patients and relatives is quite difficult. And um, we also learned a lot from this on further steps how to how to further develop this. Um, so I think this is important to and I'll show you some resources on other things you can do to obtain a bit generalizable information with your randomized controlled trials. And then I want to sh show you one last example of, and this is a PhD student, it's a bit closer to uh, Indonesia. This is a PhD student from Vietnam who I supervised, and she did a project where we, um, where we developed an intervention, a pharmacist, a uh, clinical pharmacist, did a developed intervention with nurses, so it was quite a close collaboration between pharmacists and nurses, and they developed a training program to reduce uh, medication errors, so that uh, really intervenes medication preparation and administration errors. So all the different steps that you have to go through to prepare an intravenous medication, to dissolve it in the correct solvent, and to uh, mix it in the correct way, and to administer it with the correct uh, administration procedure. We looked at that, and a lot of minor or mistakes can be made, but also sometimes serious mistakes can be made. So we looked at that. And we found, um, these are the overview of the results, intervention group, control group, we found a very high error rate at baseline, and we, could, we saw that the errors reduced in follow-up, but it's still not, uh, still some things need, need to be done further um, to reduce this further, but we saw that our intervention was successful um, because it, was, it, it did reduce the error rate um, I think just another way, another kind of example of um, um, a complex, complex healthcare intervention, successful complex healthcare intervention. Okay, and with the because I think with time we'll, um, I'll just show you a few. I've got a list of references, and I think you can get all the slides. I've got a list of references also included. Um, just put a few more resources which are useful if you want to get into the area of developing and evaluating complex healthcare interventions. And one of them is, is this. This is not, uh, I know you can't read it, but it's just to put it together. This is a way of, if you do an intervention and if you evaluate it in a randomized controlled trial, I think you should do a very good process analysis. And this document helps you, this outlines very well how to do that. So that you measure, that you have information, what happened exactly, like in our trial, what happened exactly, what did the pharmacists do, what did the nurses do, and so you can explain better your results, and you get more, you can show better, this is the, the active ingredient of our complex healthcare intervention. So this is a process evaluation of, alongside your randomized controlled trial, and there are ways which help you how to set that up. And there are also a number of resources now how to report on the software interface so that you um, like you put the information that people need. So there are checklists, like you have the concept statement to report randomized control trial. We also have two different checklists which are very useful resources um, if you write papers on this. And I think I've shown you uh, the systematic review that we found about the pharmacist led interventions. And I think also, if you try and analyze all those different interventions, they were a bit similar, but like in this picture, they were not, they did, these are just some, some um, types of things they did, the pharmacists did. And as you can see from this picture, they did very different. Every, um, every intervention was composed differently. So there have been now guidelines that uh, have been published um, how to deal with that in systematic reviews. If you want to have a systematic review of all those different complex healthcare interventions, these are uh, really, I think, seven different papers have been published. A series, this, and again, I have here the reference for you, um, has been published uh, to help you how to, how to um, use that information in, if you do systematic reviews. And another one, if you want to get more involved with drug utilization research in general and you're sort of new to that area, I think this is a good, uh, this is a book, I'm co-editor of this book and we published this two years ago and it gives you 
maybe everything we want to know about, or nearly everything we want to know about drug utilization research, how to do the method. It's got a very good method section, also available as ebook, so maybe the library has access to it. Um, so it's got a good method section, how to measure drug utilization, how to uh, the different definitions, the categories, the uh, um, vault, how to measure form during, and it's got also a research design, and it's got also uh, some resources, of examples of drug utilization research projects, a bit like what I've shown you today. So much, much more is available in this book. Okay, so before we have maybe some time for a little bit of discussion, I hope I'll, I've, I've given you a little bit of an idea of what is complex, what are complex healthcare interventions, how to evaluate those, how to develop those, how to evaluate those, and uh, what resources you could need. And I think what I didn't really talk much about is something which is, at least in our health system, increasingly more important to also include patients. Because eventually we want to improve patient outcomes. So if we think of things that uh, we think as healthcare professionals maybe are important, but patients don't like it, or they think of well, not going to this uh, to use this service. So I think there are also ways now to include patient perspective in some ways. And I'm sure it will be becoming well, it, it's quite tricky how to do that, but it's increasingly I think very important to include it, to think from a patient. And also, whatever you develop, think from the start about the wider context, the implementation. What I also didn't talk about is cost effectiveness. Think also about the cost of this intervention and the possible effectiveness from the start of it to develop something that can be also paid by the health insurance or can be paid by patients or the cost of whatever, so that you develop something which is relevant also. And this is, uh, I think with this I want to uh, say thank you for listening.